Thank you very much. It's a great conference. It's a real pleasure to be here. And Christy was generous enough to let me go next because the connection between my paper and Stephanie's paper is incredible. So in a sense, we could have been in the same session too. So um, I'm going to be revisiting what I call the classical, or actually what Richard Musgrave calls the classical benefit-based taxation approach. But just to give you an overview of what this is all about, in the context of Stephanie's paper, she talks about these welfare weights at an allocation right, of taxation. And she started the presentation by talking about an objective function in the standard theory of optimal taxation. Instead of starting at the welfare weights that you might have at the optimal allocation, and as she does, try to sort of tease out what those might be in reality, what the prevailing uh, marginal welfare weights might be, I'm going to start back at the beginning. What might the objective function be that actually prevails in reality that would end up creating such welfare weights? So we're just starting at the two opposite ends of essentially the same problem, trying to understand prevailing normative priorities uh, in ta underlying tax policy. Okay, also, uh, I'm going to connect to a comment that Partha made earlier today uh, on the utility rank reversals. We're going to talk a little bit about the commensurability thing that came up in Etai's paper. So, that, so this is going to uh, touch on a lot of really interesting topics that we talked about today. Uh, classical benefit-based taxation, just before I jump into this, a lot of you are probably familiar with benefit-based taxation in various guises, which has been criticized quite a bit over time, and in fact has sort of faded from the optimal tax literature. There was a big moment in the early 20th century when people cared a lot about benefit-based taxation, and now it's uh, taken very much a side, uh, side part. And the classical version of benefit-based taxation, I think, is worth a second look. And that's what this paper is going to be about, and I'm going to try to uh, introduce you to if you're not familiar with it. OK, so this paper is one of a series that come up from the same motivation. And that is that, as Stephanie just discussed, the theory of optimal policy starts with an objective function, right? And Usually economists have chosen that based on our, you might say, naive philosophical reasoning, okay, relative to this room. So, oh, utilitarianism, that works pretty well, or Rawlsianism, our version of, of Rawls, uh, which is just maximin. And so we throw this in uh, as the objective function. Or if we are uncomfortable taking such a strong stand, we might do something like step way back and let's say, let's just maximize flexibility. And for economists, that usually means let's only impose Pareto efficiency. Right? We won't go beyond that. We can't say anything about tax policy unless it's Pareto inefficient. And so the alternative that I've been interested in exploring is what I call positive optimal tax theory. And that's the notion of viewing this objective as an empirical object. All right, so let's go out and ask people or figure out what we think the prevailing objective function might be that informs tax policy. Now, I know we're going to have a discussion about whether that's something you actually care about. Right? So do we care about what your average person thinks should be the objective function in tax policy or what the political equilibrium has generated as what uh, is the objective for tax policy? Uh, for a while, I'm going to ask you to run with me on that being an idea. And I think the, the advantage, at least to an economist, of this approach, are there are two, essentially. So first, it returns us to a more circumspect role. So when, when I was in graduate school anyways, the idea was that economists take the objective function as given, and then we f tell you how to get there. We aren't the ones who impose it. And I know there's a different field in this room who probably have a different attitude towards what their job is, and that's totally fine. Um, but for us anyways, it's nice to be able to rely on something other than our own introspection. But it's still a constructive role, right? So we step back, but we don't just say Pareto efficiency. We can go beyond that. We can pick a point, in other words, on that Pareto frontier, very much as Stephanie's work is trying to do. And it gives us, at least I think, a disciplined way to choose that point on the frontier, right? So we can look for what we think might be reasonable or defensible objectives that get us to different points on the Pareto frontier than maybe we otherwise would have gotten. So again, you may not buy into the positive approach, and we'll, I, I'm more than happy to talk about that. But suppose you wanted to, for the next 20 minutes, go with me on that journey. How would you do it? Well, very much as Stephanie's doing with MTurk, and I have a paper using MTurk. A lot of us are using this these days. Um, you want to infer normative priorities from some sort of data. And so you can do things like you can do surveys where you ask people questions about tax policy they want. You can do things as she described and as I'll also talk about where there are features of policy that you think people actually believe in robustly. So they're not accidents of history. They're things that if you had a considered discussion with people, they would say yes. Like for instance, that we don't tax height. You can look for things like that that help you distinguish between principles, right? And then try to explain them with the principles. And then, and, and so these inspired some previous work of mine and Stephanie's and so on. And then this paper is actually inspired by a third source of data, which is rhetoric. So it occurred to me as I was working on this that 
you might expect political leaders, especially when they're trying to convince us of tax policy, to use terms that are somehow tapping into people's normative intuitions on what tax policy should be about, or normative opinions. And so I wanted to find out what they said, and so I started looking at, you know, what does President Obama say when he wants to raise the progressivity of tax rates, for instance? Okay, so that's what this paper's about, and this is what the paper's gonna do. It's first it's gonna present some rhetorical evidence of what I think of as pers the persistent relevance of this classical benefits-based taxation. And, and here's the, a rough definition of what that is. Individuals ought to pay taxes based on their abilities to earn income because those abilities are the best measure of the benefit they obtain from the activities of the state. Okay, so it's a little, long, a little long winded, but the basic idea is benefit-based taxation is the right way to think about taxes or is, an, is the right objective for taxes. And, and all that really means, just think of the government as a giant toll road. Right? And we should pay for the government based on how much we benefit from what it does. So that's the underlying idea, that we should have benefit-based taxation. And then the key for it being cl the classical version is that the best measure of those benefits are the abilities we have to earn income. So usually when people write benefit-based taxation, it's not that way at all. It's that you have some utility from private consumption and you have some utility from your consumption of public goods. And then people might vary in how much they like those public goods. This is actually quite different, that the way public goods are benefiting you is through your income earning ability. And that's gonna turn out to bias a lot. So first of all, not only do I think that's the version of benefit-based taxation that actually has play in how people think about taxes, but by a coincidence, I guess, of math or what, it turns out that this fits beautifully into the standard modern approach to optimal taxation, right? Because the cornerstone of, say, the, Mer the Merley's model of optimal taxation is this variation in the ability to earn income. And so now benefits flow right through ability so we can use all of our standard tools to talk about benefit-based taxation. And then the payoff from all this should be, if it is relevant and if we can use it, we should be able to show, in fact, that if you give some weight to this classical benefits-based criterion, you can understand policy better that we actually see. And so I'm gonna try and show you that, at least along some dimensions, we can do, do better in understanding the policies we have. Okay, uh, one slide on the previous title of the session, which was Endowment Taxation, or at some point this was one of the titles of the session, I'm not sure when exactly, uh, but it, it's gonna connect directly to Christie's as well. So I just said that you can put the classical benefits-based criterion right into the standard modern approach, and that's true, but it is also true that normatively they're quite distinct, and so I just wanna give you a, a clear sense for why that is. So the standard objective, and by standard I mean something like utilitarianism or some um, concave version of a social welfare function. I mean, look, I'm using terms that are not an economist term, so I may be overstepping my bounds here, but you'll get the idea. Uh, the standard objective is something like I don't deserve the return on my endowments, right? That's what an endowment tax is for. And in a sense, I do deserve a portion of the returns on others' endowments. We're trying to insure each other from behind the veil of ignorance, and so we share the returns on our endowments. Classical benefit space is exactly the opposite, basically. So I do deserve the returns on my endowments once I pay my share of taxes, and that's not like a smoke screen, that's a, there's an actual share we can calculate, and I do not deserve any of the returns on others' endowments. Right? There's just not this redistributive insurance role. So, you know, if this plays a role in how people actually think about the objective of tax policy, uh, obviously that's gonna push us in a pretty different direction than, say, the standard objective. And given that I'm gonna to try to show you evidence that it does uh, play a role, at least in how Americans, I think, reason through tax policy, then it should lead us to some very different results on the policies we have, and, and I think you'll see that it does. Okay, so let's get into that rhetorical evidence. This is pretty quick, and if you've read any of the paper, you've read these next three slides, because it's the beginning of the paper, and it's the quotes that I have for classical benefit-based taxation. So this is a fun quote. This is like the second issue of the AER, or something. <laughs> came out right after we passed the constitutional amendment allowing an income tax, which was on the very, very tippy top of the income distribution. And this was a University of Minnesota economist, uh, coincidentally, in the room. And, and you know, the key quote, well, the whole thing is kind of key. Right, so the key thing here is that, look, these rich people now paying an income tax should essentially be glad, right, to being able to make a moderate contribution to the nation which has rendered such incomes possible. Right, so the benefit of having this country of you being in this country, for you is that you are now able to pay these income taxes and you should be glad to do it. So the benefit is your ability and that's what that taxes should be based on. Okay, now who's Roy Blakey, right? Just some random academic economist. But here's FDR, okay? So in 1935, he wants to raise the progressivity of tax policy and here's what he says. First of all, I don't know if he wrote his own speeches, but he is like the most professorial president, right? I mean, it's just amazing 
right? The principle that it should be levied, I mean, it's just fantastic. So anyways, what does he do, right? So taxes should be levied in proportion to ability to pay and benefits received, and income is the best, is the measure of those two things. Now that's a really striking statement because if you remember your sort of intermediate public finance textbooks, ability to pay and benefits-based taxation are the two alternative classic ways to look at optimal tax policy. He says, nope, they're the same thing. We can measure, or they're, they're together, and we can measure them both with income. Right, and, and that makes perfect sense once you have the classic benefit-based taxation theorem or view as the idea behind this, that the best measure of your benefit is in fact your ability. And he says that's how we should be thinking about federal income taxation. And then here's the quote that actually started me writing the paper, which is how Obama talked about it in 2011. He's talking about why he wants more progressive taxation, and it, this is the key sentence. It's a base reflection of our belief that those who've benefited most from our way of life can afford to give back a little bit more. Right, so that's the perfect statement. He's Rare, he's a, a rarity among our presidents at his clarity of expressing, expressing philosophical ideas. Um, that you're, you've benefited a lot, you're able to pay more in taxes, and you should therefore do so. You can go way back though, Adam Smith's first maxim is essentially this, okay? So people should pay taxes in proportion to their abilities, that is in proportion to the revenue which they respectively enjoy under the protection of the state. Again, right, it's all the same basic idea here. And so the only point I'm trying to make with these quotes, and I've looked hard for more, I wish I could show you some really rigorous data on word usage, but I can't, but, but the only point I'm trying to make with this is that this should, I think, lead us to believe this intuition matters for how we make tax policy, at least in the United States. Um, and then we're gonna be able to test that as we go through. Okay, so this is of interest more to some people in the room than others, but I do want to show you briefly how you can put this idea into the modern optimal tax approach very simply, actually. So here's the standard setup. People differ in exogenous ability, okay, which we'll label WI. You can think of it as the wage if you want for these different types of people. They have these interpersonal comparable utility functions that Stephanie was telling us about. So you get utility from consumption and disutility from work effort where this is your income and this is your ability to produce income with effort. So Y over W is just your work effort. And then the planner is going to choose some tax policy, which is just a bundle of after-tax incomes and pre-tax incomes to maximize some objective functions subject to feasibility and incentive compatibility. Now, how am I going to work benefit-based taxation, taxation into this? Well, I'm going to, of course, get to change the objective function. Right? That's what we've been talking about the whole time. I only need to make one other change, and that's to this exogenous ability term Instead, I'm going to say that exogenous or that ability is no longer exogenous and it's a function of something that is exogenous, say some innate talent level, A, and then public goods. Okay, so your ability is now a function of the activities of the state. Everything else is exactly the same. Now you could stop here and this would actually be kind of an interesting question in itself, right? So what is optimal tax policy, even with say a utilitarian criterion, now that the ability distribution is endogenous to how much tax revenue I raise or to how I spend it in public goods? That's kind of an interesting question. But of course I'm gonna go on and, and use the fact that I've now got the basis of benefit-based taxation in my model to look for a benefits-based tax policy. Okay, so how would you do that? Um, as I sort of hinted, to find the constrained optimal policy here, and all that, it, all that means is you're maximizing the objective subject to these constraints, you can do the same thing you've always done in uh, standard modern optimal tax theory, but you need to specify the new objective, right? So what is the classical benefits-based taxation objective? It's not maximizing social welfare, it's something else. It's obviously tying benefits to, ta to ability but, or taxes to benefit, but what does that really mean? So here's what I'm gonna assume, that the benefits-based objective is to get as close this is the first step, to the first best classical benefits-based allocations as possible. Okay, so the second best is just to get as close as you can to the first best. Okay, so then what's the first best allocation? So here you gotta make a choice, and there's a long literature on how to assign taxes to benefits in economics, going all the way back to Lindahl, and perhaps even before, and so I'm gonna use Lindahl's approach, but I'm not wedded to that, and so if we have any experts in the room on this, I'm happy to talk about alternative ways to actually implement this part of it. But just to give you a brief idea of how this would actually work, so you get an intuition for benefits-based tax policy here, imagine that there's two people in the world, okay, and, or in the society, and uh, I wanna figure out how they're gonna pay for these public goods. And imagine that one of those people values or benefits from public goods more than the other. Okay, so I'm gonna go to these two people and I'm gonna say, tell me how much public goods you would like us to produce, knowing that you're gonna have to pay for half of those public goods. Okay, these two people. Well, the one who values them more is gonna want us to produce more than the one who values them less. So then all I 
might do is just raise the tax share on the one who values them more. So now that person's gonna wanna buy less, and the other person, I'm gonna lower the tax share they're gonna have to pay, they're gonna wanna buy more. At some point, they're gonna wanna have the same total level of public goods, okay, that's when GI is gonna equal G star for all I, and that whole time I've kept their tax share summing to one. That's the Lindell equilibrium, which many of us are familiar with, and it has this incredibly beautiful property that it gets us the efficient level of public goods spending, what we call the Samuelson rule for the total level of public goods where the marginal rate of transformation for private to public goods is equal to the sum of the marginal rates of substitution across individuals. But more important for our purposes is it captures this benefits-based notion that you pay for what you get, right? If you're the one who value those public goods more, if you benefited more from those public goods, you're gonna pay a higher tax share in this equilibrium. This of course requires you, requires the tax authority to know right, to be able to assign these tax shares to each individual, and so it's a first best type of thing, but uh, once we have this first best policy, we can go for the second best as I was telling you. Now in the paper, it turns out, I, I'm able to show that this first best policy depends on some really nice elasticities, and here's one thing, if you've heard about benefits-based taxation before, usually it's associated with kind of like a libertarian notion. In fact, there's a really interesting quote from Feldstein who links Nozick to either benefits-based or equal sacrifice taxes. But it turns out that you can have quite progressive benefit-based taxation, and the intuition for that is suppose that innate talent, so remember there was that your ability was equal to a function of the innate talent in public goods. If innate talented, if innately talented people are helped even more by public goods than less innately talented people, then when you tax according to benefits, you're gonna have a, prog a progressive tax. Okay, so there's nothing inherently kind of flat taxy about benefits-based taxation. Now, if it turns out that everyone's ability is multiplied by the same factor from public goods, then in fact you do have a flat tax. So there's a natural case in which you do, but it's not the only case. Okay, so, right, so we can define the first best policy, and I told you the second best was to get as close to the first best policy as possible. So here's how I formalize that. Here's the welfare function. So this is the welfare that society gets from an individual's allocation, individual I. UI is the allocation in the actual equilibrium, and this is that first best that we just found for the individual. Okay, now I know this is a little symbolic, a little mathy, but it's actually worth just working through because it's kind of interesting. So suppose that in the actual allocation you give this person less utility than you would have given them in the first best. Okay, so then you lose the difference in welfare. Instead, suppose you give that person more than they would have gotten in the first best. Well, you get that difference, except multiplied by delta, which is weekly less than one. All that means is that you're, you don't get as much benefit from giving someone more utility than the first best as you lose from giving them less. And so you're penalized for symmetric deviations from that best outcome. The planner is going to try to get as close as it can to that first best outcome. Right? It's going to really value being close um, to that first best. It's just a simple way of having a punishment function basically for deviations. Okay, so you, you punish symmetric deviations and notice one other appealing thing which is you still respect Pareto efficiency, right? So if everybody's utility goes up, even if that means they're moving away from the first best, as long as delta is not negative, and especially if it's strictly positive, you would always endorse those improvements. And that's uh, an important thing because notice I'm working in something here that's not a standard welfareist objective, right? It's a benefit-based thing and we know from various work like Capital and Chevelle that if you put something non-welfareist in this objective function, you can violate Pareto efficiency. So how did I avoid that? Well, I kind of relaxed this non-welfareist thing, right? I said, yeah, people want benefits-based taxation, but they're not unreasonable. <laughs> right? If you gave them a Pareto improvement, they would still take it. Okay. So that's the math, the math part, how you'd fit it in. So now, the payoff should be that if we can do this, uh, if, that if this thing matters, and if we can put it into the um, framework, we should be able to explain policy better. So let me see if I can show you how that happens. Now to do that, I wanna be clear that I don't think policy is made exclusively based on this benefits-based criterion. I think it's probably just one part of it. In fact, one thing that I've been learning throughout this uh, project is that normative diversity seems to be a key aspect of how Americans at least think about tax policy. And I'm not, this is by far, I'm not the first person to say this. So um, it turns out most people are just not normative purists. So there's a lot of, it, of evidence in psychology, political science, could be philosophy, I don't know that evidence as well, even among economists, that when you go out and ask people, they say, you know, that you find stuff like this, that people are willing to trade off between principles. Or the way I tend to think of it is that people find many principles at least partially appealing to them. 
Okay, and so what I wanted to explore is the notion that, let's say we combined classical benefits-based taxation objective with, say, conventional utilitarianism. Right, so suppose that these are two principles competing with people or competing inside people's minds for priority. The nice thing about that, how would you ever combine these two? This gets to the commensurability question that we had earlier with regard to Etai's paper, right? So we've got something that's sort of a non-welfarist criterion and then utilitarianism. How would you ever weigh those two things against each other? Well, it turns out that that objective function I just showed you does it for you. Okay, so if delta is equal to one, this is the utilitarian social welfare function, right? You just get the utilities from each individual. The, fixed, the first best allocations are fixed with regard to the allocation you're actually gonna do, so you're just gonna get the full value of utility from each person. So if delta is one, you're back to full utilitarianism. If delta is zero, then you don't get any gains when you give someone more utility. You just lose when you deviate from the first best benefits base, so that's an extreme version of allegiance to the, first best, to the benefits base criterion. And so this delta gives me this nice way to scale myself between these two criteria or provide some sort of mix in the population. Okay, so what I wanna show you is the results for optimal policy along three dimensions that we might wanna explain. And this gets to where Stephanie was talking about puzzles. Right, what are some puzzles in existing policy that we can't explain very well with just plain utilitarianism and that this, maybe this would help us with? So I'm gonna talk about extended progressivity, rank reversals in the first best, and tagging. And tagging is in the title of the session, so I will actually be talking about that. Um, except that there's an elephant in the room I haven't talked about at all, which is this production function for ability. I mentioned it briefly, but right, what is this ability, this, this mystical ability production function? W is equal to F of A and G. Well, I can't find anything in the literature on this, on how public goods actually magnify innate talents for individuals. Uh, there may be something in some literature that I don't know of, but so this is my shortcut, at least for now, which is I'm gonna assume, like in the equality opportunity literature, people have fixed positions in income distribution, and then public goods shift the parameters of that income distribution. Okay, so if, if or excuse me, of the ability distribution. So if the ability distribution is log normal, with some mean and standard deviation, that mean and that standard deviation get pushed around by how much public goods spending you have. Okay, and so then if you're an individual at the, the 50th percentile of that distribution, your actual ability is gonna move around with public goods. And then I specify sort of ad hoc uh, equations for what that mean and that standard deviation might be as a function of G. Now, of course it's ad hoc, like I said, I don't, I'm not sure where to get guidance on this, uh, but there's a couple features of this that are kind of nice. So, First of all, because of this term here, as g goes to zero, thanks, this goes to negative infinity, and that mathematically just means that everyone's ability goes to zero, which is probably what you want, right? So one of the big critiques of benefit-based taxation is that you can't have people valuing public goods and assume that their abilities stay fixed. That's just silly. If we change the state, people's abilities would, go, would, would change. And in particular, if you had no state, what would society even look like? Right? What's the benchmark relative to which we compare the current state? Well, the nice thing about this is that, in fact, as you have no state, we're all walking around in the forest, we basically have no ability to turn income. And that's probably the benchmark I think we would want. It's also like a relatively empirically tractable frame, um, specification in the sense that if you thought you could get data, like from Glenn's paper, in fact, on the income distributions in society, you might be able to try to back out some of the coefficients in this if you knew how much public good spending there was. Okay, I'm gonna, as I mentioned briefly, I'm gonna talk about a, I'm a baseline case of this production function, which is just if these betas are both zero, then the standard deviation is fixed with respect to G. And so you get a flat tax at this coefficient G. Uh, for the economist in the room, it's sort of a Cobb-Douglas result, actually. That's the coefficient in a Cobb-Douglas production function. And so the baseline case is gonna be a flat tax with classical benefit-based taxation, and so now we can talk about these three dimensions. So in progressivity, Given that the benefits-based baseline that I'm consuming, uh, assuming is flat, utilitarianism is gonna be quite progressive. Obviously, any mix is gonna get us somewhere in between. So the utilitarian, this is for the US income distribution. So the US, uh, the utilitarian optimal tax function looks like this one, it's the top one. The top average tax rate's 46%. The benefits base is, is flat at 8%. And so obviously, if I, go, if I weight those two, if I pull delta down from one up to, or yeah, down from one up to say 0.2, then case two is this dashed line here where the top rate is 31%, relative to the data it's 30%. Now of course there's a million reasons why progressivity might be you know, lower than it is in the utilitarian case, and this is just one of them. 
right? Could be elasticities, could be other things like that, but it seems plausible to me, especially given the rhetorical evidence, that it's the objective function that's part of the reason why we don't have as much progressivity as the standard model would, would suggest. Okay, but some other tests. So this gets to part this question from much earlier today about rank reversals. Should utilities rise or fall with ability in the first best? Right, well, in utilitarianism, they fall. Basic idea, we want to redistribute a lot from the people at the top, make them work really hard and redistribute their income, uh, and that makes some people uncomfortable. Not everybody, some people. Under benefit space, we don't reverse ranks, and here's just a graph of rank reversals. Under utilitarianism, you reverse ranks. This is uh, ability and utility. Under benefit space, you have an upward slope like you would have in the laissez-faire, and in between, you're somewhere in between. And then finally, since this is in the topic of the talk of the session, let me talk about tagging. So getting to this discussion, under utilitarianism, you would tag height, you'd tag race, you'd tag gender, meaning you would tax people because statistically, tall people, especially tall white males in the United States, make more than other categories. Under this, you don't, and just the intuition of this is important. So under benefit space, you don't because a tall man and a short man with the same ability have benefited the same from the state. Right, so you have no justification for taxing them differently under a criterion like this. And so I ran some quick little simulations with tagged groups. So I've got low, middle, and high, short, middle, tall. You could think of it as under utilitarianism, you do a lot of tagging. You take 8% from the tall group and give 10% income to the low group. Here it's quite progressive taxation. If you move to this 0.2 scenario, you do essentially no tagging and you've still got quite progressive policy. So again, sort of leavening these two objectives together, I think we can do a better job of understanding the policies we have, as well as, maybe more importantly, capturing the public debates that we have over taxation. I'll stop. Thanks. I absolutely loved um, working with Matt. I loved reading his paper. Uh, one of the things, I don't think I told this to Matt, but one of the questions I was asked when I was on the job market is whether I was familiar with Matt's work. So um, that was actually Josh Cohen who asked. I don't know if Amanda's in the room. But, um, so a philosopher asked me if I was familiar with your work. Um, and I also am really grateful to Matt because he put up with about eight different questions that were all on equation number one. <laughs> so he patiently answered all of my questions. So I just want to sort of ask some questions about sort of the underlying normative view, uh, sort of what it is that he's doing, the motivation for his project. So he starts with this question uh, in the paper which says, now why go through the trouble of attempting to resuscitate this view, the classical benefits-based uh, taxation view? And he says, look, it's not because I'm going to normatively defend it. Instead, I'm going to appeal to it because other people appeal to it. Uh, and he takes that to be sort of sufficient motivation for uh, taking this approach. And my worry is, and so this was an example that I gave to Matt that sort of caused me some qualms, was that suppose that um, my question was about the Monty Hall problem, and I just asked people, should I choose, so suppose that I chose door number two, and then Monty Hall reveals a goat behind door number three, and crucially in the, in the Monty Hall problem, it's not random that Monty Hall picked door number three, Monty Hall picked the door with the goat behind it. And so the worry is that um, lots of people, this was a huge debate, lots of people thought, no, you should stick with door number two, don't switch to door number one. But of course, you can, you can increase your probability if you switch to door number one, since it wasn't random that he picked the, the, the uh, door with the goat behind it. So the worry is that um, if you just ask people what it is that we should do, you're going to get a lot of answers for picking door number two, which is sort of the initial door that they picked, even though most economists and statisticians and mathematicians would tell you to pick door number one. Um, and I, I did at one point try to explain this problem to my mother on the phone. And on the phone is especially hard to describe this problem because I was having her write down little numbers and you know boxes and stuff. And we got to the end of the conversation which she said, no, I agree with you, you're right, but I'm still going to pick door number two. <laughs> <laughs> so th the question is, we wouldn't, we wouldn't just ask the population, hey, should we go with door number one, should we go with door number two, or should we go, well, door number three is off, off, 
limits. Instead, I, I think that Matt would say, no, actually we should go with door number one, so we wouldn't just ask people what it is that they think. So now when we get into the normative domain, or at least uh, the moral domain, um, so we're no longer asking empirical questions or questions about how it is, how people should reason about things, Matt takes a different approach, I'm assuming, in which he says, no, now we should go out and ask people what their normative views are. And so my thinking is that there must be some sort of meta-ethical uh, view that underlies this distinction, that in one case we shouldn't just go out and ask people what to do, but in the normative case, or in the moral case, we should go out and ask people what they should do. And I'm sort of worried about what what underlies that distinction and whether or not we need a justification itself for that distinction. And so I sort of was imagining Matt thinking, you know, should I be a Rawlsian or a utilitarian? And thinking, gosh, the, the Rawlsian story, really, I find that really appealing. But then thinking, no, he should just reject the Rawlsian story in favor of going with whatever it is that people actually think. So whatever's in the rhetoric, assuming that the rhetoric is reflecting what, what people actually think. And that's not just being agnostic. That's not being sort of humble and not making a decision, a moral decision. That's actually making a moral decision, namely the decision that what we should do is uh, figure out what it is that other people think that we should do. So I had some sort of qualms about sort of what it is that's, that's underlying this view about what we should do. So, and I'll just give one specific example that, that came out of um, his paper. So he didn't put this quote online, but it's Richard Musgraves, who all philosophers of, you know, who know Rawls also know Richard Musgraves' work. Um, so he says that observers such as myself, this is Musgrave talking, not Matt. Observers such as myself who tend to be egalitarian should not rule out the norm of Lockean entitlement to earnings as an alternative criterion that deserves cri consideration. So I completely agree. Egalitarians should not rule out the norm of Lockean entitlement to earnings as, a cr as an alternative criterion that deserves consideration. Deserves consideration, I then reject it. But it deserved consideration, and I, I don't mean to be completely flip, it deserved adequate consideration. But then Musgrave goes on to say, most people, I suggest, would wish to assign some weight to both norms. I also think that entitlement to earnings, the Lockean and Adam Smith tradition, has its merit. I would give it, say, one quarter weight, with three quarters weight to the Rawlsian uh, concept. And that is, in fact, what Matt does in his paper, is he says, all right, you know, let's have this variable, and we can give three quarters weight to one and one quarters weight to another. And I just find that incoherent because these views actually conflict with one another. So to give one three quarters weight and another one one quarters weight, I, I find what you do less incoherent than what, uh, what Musgrave said. But so I guess my, my general question is that I would just like to hear more about what's sort of underlying the motivation. And I felt like this was uh, true of the earlier paper as well. Can I just respond real quickly yeah. to it? Which, real quick. Finding that Musgrave quote next to the birth of my child and marrying my wife was maybe the best moment of my life. <laughs> in, this, in, the, in the following sense, which is, that, which is that Christie's exactly right, right? That that is almost verbatim what I'm doing. I mean, I'm modifying them so I don't find them quite so contradictory with each other, but that's exactly, it's a weight on these two different things. And the fact that Musgrave, who's a pretty sophisticated guy, not someone who would be tricked by the Monty Hall paradox or whatever, had thought about these issues for decades, that was his perspective, I was like, Great. So I'm very eager for the conversation. <laughs> um, Stephanie? Yeah, so one way, I think, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but one way to say if you could put a two-thirds weight on one objective and one-third on another objective is that within the population, there's two-thirds yeah. of people who purely put weight on one objective and one-third on another. And if you want to a political process of voting, it comes out as if everybody puts a two-thirds weight on it. But I think Chris, 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 did you want to respond I, to that? Well, I do want Please. to respond, yeah. yeah. So that doesn't, so that means that the population's not incoherent, but that still <laughs> means that the model's incoherent when mm. it does that. Why? Well, the political economy is tricky with that too. So right, right, if it's two thirds are utilitarian, you might think the median voter was utilitarian or something. So it's a, so you're right, in, in an earlier paper like this, I had sort of both intuitions. I ended up actually believing personally that it's more that each individual, or at least the median voter, I should say, is, is uh, conflicted. Or maybe but. 
are on a 130 kilohertz, then it turns out that it's as if the media goes to 230 yeah, yeah. or something yeah. like that. But I mean, you can rationalize it. Right. Everybody, if you're bothered by people having several preferences, it could be that everybody has pure preferences. Society looks right. as if it has been. Yeah. But just to articulate a little bit more Christie's position, not to say I completely believe it, but it seems to me like that is not a particularly compelling case for saying that we should endorse what it happens to be the case, or even mm -hmm. reason about what happens to be the case with that one third and two thirds, and then put a weight on that. I mean, the political process, as we know from Eros theorem, we need to just utter chaos. Why should we endorse what comes out mm -hmm. of that? Well, I'm not arguing for the approach rather than normative, but that's one other way to bother by the contradiction argument. Richard? Just one response on what I have is that, well, look, if we're wondering what policy should be, we just, uh, on empirical and mathematical questions, we don't go to the man and woman in the street, right? But, but some element of policy is going to be the normative issues or the evaluative issues, the moral issues. And there, there are no experts in a democracy. Everybody counts the same or something. But I wonder why. I mean, there, there, there are respectable views in moral philosophy that are anti-elitist with respect to who, who, whose opinion counts. Locke, for instance, thinks that every, the, the moral laws are written on our hearts. It, it, you just consult your conscience. And we, it's guaranteed that you'll find the truth, you'll find the correct moral law, and everybody will find the same, because they're written there by God, and God, roughly as a utilitarian, God, God <laughs> cares for our prosperity. So we can, even without a sacred book, we can figure out what God's commands are, because, because the commands have got to make sense. They have to be such that if we all obey them, or most of us obey them, we'll be prosperous. And so, and God figure, and so Locke uses, figures out what the moral law on that basis is, and that's, and there, there on that basis, there's a, an anti-elitism that makes sense, but it relies on theological premises that I think we shouldn't accept. If we don't accept the theological premises, I just think reason goes where it goes. I mean, maybe, maybe the, who, why does morality have to be simple? Maybe it requires a complicated, quad, you know, I don't know, some quadratic equation that you can understand that I can't. And so, you know, there's just, there can just be moral expertise the same way there can be uh, uh, mathematical expertise and empirical expertise. Why not? Yeah, so I think um, part of the, the force of uh, Christie's objection has to do with sort of aggregating reasons that are mutually inconsistent with one another. So, you know, we can think about the case where, um, if we think actually about aggregating reasons rather than aggregating people's views, you know, then we maybe get a more sensible picture because you may, you may think at some point that different for yourself that you have multiple values and these values considered in isolation may lead you in different directions, but it's not incoherent to think that both of those values are important, in which case it seems reasonable to aggregate them. On the other hand, two people disagree because there's an underlying disagreement on some premise and one person thinks it's true and the other person thinks it's false and then we just say well let's take an average you know then we get into something very different so i think it's important to consider let's say when matt's what matt is doing is you know what kind of aggregation are we doing and there is a little bit of a danger if we just sort of take the shares in the population that we're aggregating across real inconsistencies and and just to emphasize that i would say like you know just think of a standard economic model it can, in some cases, make no difference, but in nonlinear models, make a huge difference whether there's a 50% chance that the parameter value equals whatever, you know, one parameter value and a 50% chance that it's something else versus that it's halfway in between the two mm -hmm. values. In nonlinear models, which these certainly are, mm -hmm. those could be completely different conclusions that it yields. Yep. Yeah. Joanna? So uh, I, I think this is very interesting, but I th even though it could seem logically inconsistent, I think that there's two reasons why we should care about why pe what people think. And, and one is that I think from a point of view of explaining policy, uh, it's very important we can ask what, what kind of thinking explains this policy. Or conversely, if we think we know what people think, are we actually getting the policies that they want? And that's kind of the whole political economy uh, problem. One. And second, I think even as a philosopher, you know, Rose was talking about this famous concept of reflective equilibrium. So we are doing some kind of theory because at some level we think that some principles are intuitive. Now, you know, if you're a philosopher, you probably want to pick some principles uh, that 
are popular, although that's not the only guidance, but you want to consider, you know, should I maybe incorporate that sort of principle in my theory in order to make it intuitively appealing and plausible uh, to, the, to the larger public. But, you know, I don't think that that solves the logical, potential logical inconsistencies, but it just says it's important to understand what, what people uh, think about, uh, you know, which principles one should use. I also want to make a little methodological plea that we shouldn't only conduct surveys, but we should also consider genuine ethnography when we think about this stuff. And the reason is that it's very easy in a survey to take your views mm -hmm. and sort of already know what you're going to get out of the survey and it effectively impose what you're thinking on your subjects through the way in which things are constructed. Whereas actually trying to go and have a conversation where you work through things with the person that you're talking to can sometimes lead mm -hmm. you to come to different things than you would otherwise come to. But go ahead, yeah. uh, I've heard that there's research on the brain that says that we have a couple of different brains. There's the brain of the emotions, the medulla, and the brain of rationality and, and empathy in the uh, frontal cortex. And there's some sense in which the two parts of the brain compete for control. And that would provide a possible reason uh, that we could find people with these, this mixture of inconsistent attitudes. Uh, but it seems to me, if we were to find that people do have these inconsistencies, and, and we go to the further question of whether we should be troubled by it or not, it would be interesting to find out in terms of in-depth interviews. When you uh, question people over a long span of time, do they say, yes, I, I want this inconsistent mixture in the policy, or do they eventually say, no, that is inconsistent, I, I want some consistency? I don't know what the result of that would be, and it would be interesting to find out. Yeah, I mean, so just I'll jump in for one second. I mean, one of the findings that most influenced me is Jennifer Hochschild's work. She's a gov professor at Harvard. I mean, she, I think her early work in her career was exactly this, spending a lot of time over and over with a small group of families, asking them various things, and she finds very much this sort of like, you can call it confusion, you can call it mixed objective reasoning, you know, whatever, however you want to label it. Um, but that they do vacillate between different extremes, they express liberal preferences, but then they say, oh, but the rights of the individual are actually pretty strong. So, you know, so I, I agree with Glenn that MTurk is a bit risky sometimes, but it seems like the in-depth stuff finds a similar thing. I mean, to, to Richard's point, I think that is such a great question, right? So, like, are there experts on these issues, just like there would be on Monty Hall? We know there's a right answer there, in a sense. We know they're not philosophers, but I think there's no <laughs> Right. And so I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, I guess as an economist, I'm predisposed, either through self-selection or brainwashing in the graduate school, to think that we are not experts on moral things any more than anyone else. Whereas I would guess, I don't know what philosophy departments are like, but I bet you're trained to think very hard about what is the one what is the most defensible true answer to a normative criterion? And so uh, Why maybe do it's you just. Why believe we're not experts, Matt? <laughs> you are. <Yeah. laughs> Why? I, I don't yeah, mean, yeah. I, I mean, rationally, not, not, not like your training or whatever. Well, well, can you articulate why you don't believe that? Hmm. Just about morality. You think you're an expert about something, right? Of course. Sure. Yeah, yeah, no, about normative questions. No, I mean, if you think no, this about is how great. you form right, yeah. views about yeah, yeah. What, what makes people experts, often we think yeah. that seeing the consequences of a premise repeatedly yep. leads one to expertise. I guess That's something yeah. we do in economics a lot. I guess I would say that, this is a little bit on the fly, but I did have a, a friend of both of ours ask me this question with respect to wisdom of crowds, right? So he said, there's something for which wisdom of crowds I see as being super valuable. He said, normative stuff does not seem like one of those things to me. <laughs> yeah. and, and I guess my response to me would be, maybe that's not, so my view would be that your normative perspectives are informed a great deal by experience. And we all have very limited scopes of experience. And so there's a lot of people who've lived lives and therefore have normative perspectives that are quite different from mine because they lived very different lives. And so maybe I could learn from that. Okay, I think we should move on. Yeah. To Thank you, everybody. some uh, sort of assumptions and a general starting point. So let me, let me begin by saying that I'm willing to bet that most of you think that the current income distribution is unfair. I'm especially willing to bet that about Glenn, <laughs> given, his, given his earlier talk. But then the question that I take to be troublesome is what distribution of income would be fair? So I, 
also discovered that economists don't take that question to be all that troubling because they already have this neat theory, utilitarianism. Um, but I unfortunately reject utilitarianism, and that's why it becomes an especially difficult problem for me to figure out what it is, what distribution of income would be fair. So I start with this idea that we come together to cooper cooperatively produce goods. And when we do that, there's going to be some benefits and there's also going to be some burdens. And so what we want is some sort of distribution principle that's able to fairly distribute both the benefits and the burdens. So I don't assume, and this is crucial, I don't assume that fairness and Pareto are going to necessarily coincide. It would be a wonderful thing, a beautiful world if they did. But I think we can't start from the assumption that they're going to do that, nor do I think we can start from the assumption of conditioned on Pareto what would be fair. I think instead, in all fairness, we need to start from the question of what would be fair without putting any constraints on what it is that we're going to get. That doesn't mean that the outcome is going to necessarily say that this is what we should do and that we should ignore Pareto. I just think for the first question of figuring out what's fair, we do have to put Pareto considerations aside. So my answer, to give you the short answer in case you're uh, trying to get off to dinner or to get off to drinks right now, I'll tell you the answer up front, which is that I think at a minimum, a fair distribution has to be one, and so this is just a necessary condition, not a sufficient condition. A fair distribution has to be one in which no one receives a bundle that no one would be willing to accept. So I take that as pretty minimal. We're trying to distribute bundles of, of goods and uh, burdens, and if there's a particular bundle that no one would be willing to accept, I take it that that bundle, that the distribution that includes that bundle is not fair. And I take that to be pretty minimal. So the idea is, can I just take what I consider to be pretty minimal and get some pretty um, uh, significant results from just taking that minimal uh, criterion? So some of the other candidate principles for a fair distribution that I consider are John Rawls's difference principle, which very roughly has the idea that the least advantaged should be as well off as they can be, or more specifically, that deviations from equality are permissible only when they make the worst off person as best off as she can possibly be. Uh, equal capacity to earn is sort of roughly in this idea of an endowment tax. So this is, uh, a I'm speaking somewhat roughly here, but this is something that John Romer endorses, that Stuart White endorses. So it's generally just the idea that for any proportion P, all individuals working at P of their maximum earning capacity should receive the same income. So if you're working at 50% of your maximum earning capacity and I'm working at 50% of mine, we should both receive the same income. It's very rough. So Philippe Van Parais has this idea of undominated diversity which is just that for any pair of bundles, and specifically I'm going to be talking about job income bundles, but for, so, for any pair of them, there shouldn't be one that's unanimously dispreferred that would violate the, the um, un undominated diversity criterion. And then finally, one that seems to be popular with economists and a little bit so with philosophers is this idea of envy freeness. And I'm not familiar with Glenn's work, although there was some mention that you are working on envy freeness, so I would love to, love to read it. So envy freeness is just the idea that everyone should get the bundle such that they don't prefer the bundle that someone else has. So no one should prefer someone else's job income bundle to her own. So although economists typically apply it to different contexts, uh, Ronald Dworkin sort of famously applied it to job income bundles, although he changed from ex ante to ex post, and that changes his analysis. But I won't be talking about the details of Dworkin today. So I'm going to be arguing against all four of those. But I take envy freeness to have something right about it. And the question I want to know is sort of what is right about the envy free approach. So I begin my task by saying, well, let's take something that we all know is unfair and then ask why is it that it's unfair? So I start from the question of sort of how do we characterize unfairness? And so the example that I start with is I say, suppose we have a capricious baker. 
he's dividing a cake between two people who have identical standing, et cetera, et cetera, such that the fair distribution between them is that each gets a half. But suppose the baker gives one of them one quarters of the cake and the other three quarters of the cake. So we know that this is an unfair distribution, and the question that I want to ask is, well, what makes it unfair? So if Betty, who's the person who gets one quarter of the cake, says, look, this distribution is unfair, what exactly is it that her complaint is? So it can't just be my slice is too small. I mean, obviously, that's not going to generalize. Sometimes it's better to have the smaller bundle. And, and we also don't know what it means to say it's too small as opposed to merely smaller. So her claim can't just be it's unfair because my slice is too small. Our complaint also can't be that what's unfair is the assignment of bundles. Because if she's complaining about fairness, she would have to agree that if we switched and Betty got three quarters and Andrew got one quarter, that that would also be unfair. So it's not the way that the bundles have been assigned that's unfair. Rather, it's something about the bundles themselves that's unfair. So she might point to one of the following two facts. So the first fact is her bundle is such that she would not have chosen it. And since she's making a fairness complaint, she realizes that Andrew is going to have a reciprocal position. So she would acknowledge that also it would be necessary both for it to be that her bundle is such that uh, she would have been willing to choose it and that Andrew's bundle has to be such that he would be willing to choose it. And in this case, uh, her bundle is such that she would not be willing to choose it. So that would be her complaint. And then the second fact that she might point to is her bundle is such that no one would be willing to choose it. So no one specifically in our um, distributive scheme would have been willing to choose it. So the envy test refers obviously to the first. So no one should receive a bundle she would not have chosen or been indifferent to. The minimal acceptability test in contrast, which is my criterion, invokes the second. So no one should receive a bundle that no one would have chosen or been indifferent to. Now, obviously, there's a relationship between these two facts. So when you satisfy envy freeness, you also necessarily satisfy the minimal acceptability criterion. I mean, this just follows from the fact that if I say no one should receive a bundle she would not have chosen, then no one should receive a bundle that no one would have chosen, just follows from that. But the opposite relationship crucially doesn't hold. So it's possible that you could satisfy the minimal acceptability test without also satisfying the envy test. So then there's a question as to, well, why would we ever want to do that? So suppose that you could satisfy the envy test. You could make an envy-free distribution, in which case it seems like if you assign bundles in such a way that they satisfied the minimal acceptability test, but they didn't satisfy envy freeness, you would just be dooming yourself to a Pareto inefficient distribution of bundles. So why would we ever want to do that? We probably wouldn't want to do that. But where it becomes interesting is when we can't satisfy the envy test, there isn't an envy free distribution, but we can satisfy the minimal acceptability test. So I take it that that's sort of where it becomes interesting. And I also think that maybe the minimal acceptability test pulls out what it is that's really sort of crucial about the fairness that was built into envy freeness. So why do we think that an envy free distribution was fair? Well, actually, because it satisfies this minimal acceptability test. And then it has this additional virtue of being parade efficient. So what I want to look at is specifically the labor market in which the envy test cannot be uh, satisfied. So the reason the envy test can't be satisfied in the labor market is because you'll get situations, so I'm assuming that productive capacities differ, and you'll get situations in which, say, I'm a doctor, but I really want to be a lawyer. I just don't have the skills to be a lawyer. And Ite is a 
lawyer but really wants to be a doctor. I'm not sure if I just said that uh, right. Uh, for, for, for the same level of income, like holding income constant. So it'll turn out in that case that no matter what I do, no matter how much I tax and redistribute, it will be impossible for the distribution to be envy free. It will either be the case that he envies my bundle of income and, and work, or I envy his bundle of income and work, or both. But it, we won't be able to get rid of envy altogether. All right. So I instead want to invoke uh, this thought experiment for how it is that we can think about getting uh, minimal acceptability criterion satisfied in a labor market in which productive capacities differ. And I think this gets at the distinction between deserved income versus luck income. So consider the following thought experiment. Thought experiments in bold so that you realize this is just a thought experiment, not something we would actually run. So the first step is to identify the occupational positions that exist in the real world. So if there's 300 corporate lawyers in the real world, there's going to be 300 corporate lawyers in the thought experiment. So we just identify the number of people in each occupational position. And then we envision a society identical to ours, except for this one change. So the preferences crucially are going to be the same. So the only change is that everyone is now equally qualified for all occupational positions. So now I could be a lawyer or I could be a doctor and so, so forth. So the preferences remain the same as well as sort of the strengths of my preferences. So if I much prefer being a hockey player to being a philosophy professor in the real world, I'm going to continue in the thought experiment to much prefer being a hockey player to being a philosopher. All right, so now we're going to hold an ascending auction in which the individuals in step two are going to bid for the occupational positions identified in step one. So basically, we're just going to imagine we have, we have all the occupational positions, and we just imagine that we all are capable, equally capable, of performing any of those occupational positions. And we just imagine the auctioneer starts from zero and raises the, the pay for each one until a sufficient number are willing to do that one, that occupational position, even though they could bid for any other occupational position. So obviously, this auction is going to have to go on for a very, very long time, because you've got to go through all of the occupational positions, and then people are going to change their mind, because when they see, oh, the veterinarian got that much, I now decide that I no longer want to be uh, the lawyer type of a thing. So they're going to keep changing their positions. But the idea is that how you would bid is that you have, you have these preferences in mind such that you would rather be, say, a philosophy professor for $50,000 than a, a coal miner for $250,000. But if coal miners got paid $300,000, you might flip what it is that you, you decide to do in this auction. So the auction continues until all of the occupational positions have been assigned, and each individual has been assigned to an occupational position, and everybody declares themselves satisfied with the result. OK, that takes some imagination. But you have to imagine that it could reach this equilibrium point at which everybody declares themselves satisfied. And at that point, um, we would have an envy-free distribution in that auction. So everybody declares themselves satisfied with the result. So the idea, and this is, this is sort of a crucial idea, is that we're then going to use those equilibrium levels of pay to model taxation and redistribution in the real world. And this is sort of the crucial step, because Van Perez has, has a somewhat similar auction when he's talking about um, rents, job rents, which are not the same as my rents, but rents from the fact that jobs are, are themselves scarce. And he then discards the process immediately because he said, well, no, look, if we, had this, if we had this auction in which people could bid for any job, even though they might not be qualified to do that job, then this is going to run into the problem that people who aren't qualified to do jobs are in those jobs. Right? So he discards the whole approach. Whereas my auction is just supposed to be imagining that people are going to be bidding for these jobs as if they were going to be doing them. But then what we take from the auction is not that people actually do those jobs, but just that we're taking those levels of pay to figure out what it is that would satisfy the minimal acceptability criterion test in the actual world. <clears throat> 
All right, so it's also dynamic. It would have to keep changing, and it is subject to a budget constraint. And the budget constraint could keep changing as well. So once the budget constraint changes, you would have to rerun the, the auction. Once the distribution of occupational positions change, you would also need to uh, rerun the auction. All right, but the point is that through this test, we can imagine what it would be like for occupational positions to satisfy the minimal acceptability test. So, and then what I want to point out is that these other uh, candidate principles that I considered at the beginning of the paper, none of them satisfy the minimal acceptability test. So if you found it somewhat appealing to you that fairness requires that nobody gets a bundle that no one would be willing to accept, then it seems like you also have to reject these other principles. So Rawls's difference principle, because it ignores labor burdens, and that's actually a crucial part, he couldn't just change his theory to add labor burdens in. Because it ignores labor burdens, it's not going to necessarily satisfy the minimal acceptability test. So the equal capacity to earn is the same. It also ignores burdens. So Stuart White's model, for example, what he uh, equalizes is that if everybody works, say, 30 hours in their maximum earning capacity, they should all get the same um, income. So he equalizes income access to equal, to equal leisure income bundles, but he doesn't take differential burdens into consideration at all, differential occupational burdens. So by occupational burdens, I mean being a coal miner is much more work than being a philosophy professor. And that's why in the auction, it would come out to be the case that people would require more money to be a coal miner than to be a philosophy professor. All right, so undominated diversity also fails to satisfy the uh, minimal acceptability criterion, but for a different reason. In this case, it does take into account uh, occupational burdens, but because it uses pairwise comparisons instead of global comparisons, it won't necessarily satisfy the minimal acceptability test. So I give a very simple example here in which Andrew prefers X to Y to Z, Betty prefers X to Z to Y, and Connie prefers Z to Y to X. And if you do pairwise comparisons, it satisfies the undominated diversity criterion. There is no one uh, letter that's dominated in any pairwise comparison. Nonetheless, uh, no one would have been willing to choose bundle Y. All right, and then envy freeness. If envy freeness is satisfied, that obviously does satisfy the minimal acceptability criterion. The problem is just that we're dealing with situations in which envy freeness cannot be satisfied. So Ronald Dworkin's initial approach when envy freeness cannot be satisfied was to say, well then let's minimize the amount of envy in the system. So we can't get envy freeness, so let's just try to minimize it. And I'm, I won't show it here, but that also won't necessarily satisfy uh, the minimal criterion test. All right, so the next step, if you accept the minimal acceptability criterion, the next step would be, hey, can we now add other desiderata, such as Pareto? And so what I want you to keep distinct in your mind is just that there's three questions. So one is, have I identified a criterion of fairness? The second question is, does fairness apply? Is it one of the desiderata to the labor market? So you might reject you might say yes to one, I have identified a criterion of fairness, and then say no to two, which would be fine. I hope it would still be interesting. You now have a criterion of fairness. And the third question is, what do we do about the conflict with Pareto? And I have some thoughts on the direction in which that might go, but I would love to hear your questions. Thank you. So I'll start by saying I learned a great deal talking to Christy about uh, this stuff as well about her paper and trying to understand it uh, in, I guess, economist terms a little bit. So I won't talk very much about the idea because she did a great job explaining it and you have a handout uh, so you can read more about it, about it if you want. But I just want to highlight a couple quick things. So these occupational positions, I'm just going to call them occupations, they differ in how much they pay in income per unit of effort and then they also differ in their burdensomeness or economists might often say like non-pecuniary benefits. And this is something that it took me a while to kind of really understand how, what was going on. Similarly, people differ in their talent and then their preferences over the burdensomeness of different occupations or over each occupation's burdensomeness. Okay, and so Christy, I think, really is calling attention to this, this very strong difference between burdens 
and effort. And I'll talk about that a little more in a second. One thing she didn't talk about, she hinted at it once, but she didn't really say it, which I think is quite important to this idea, is that her claim is that people earn talent rents in some occupations, right? So in an earlier paper of hers, she talked about basketball players, that they earn the, so much money, not because being a basketball player is such a terrible job that you need to get paid for it, but because they have very scarce talent. And that those are essentially unfair, that we want to get rid of talent rents. And that's really motivating this thought experiment. So just to, that'll set the stage for a discussion of that a little bit. Uh, namely, so explicitly, taxation should exactly offset talent rents. So we have this thought experiment, everyone goes in, it's sort of a veil of ignorance kind of thing. You go in, you lose your special talents, but you, gain, you keep your preferences for these occupations, and then you choose which occupation you'd want, given how much you have to pay you to take on its burdens. And then when you step out from behind this veil or behind this thought experiment, wages in an occupation after taxes depend only on how much people dislike the burdens it forces them to take on, not on the talents or rewards. And this is what gets her the minimum acceptability test being satisfied. And so I think that this is really great um, in terms of an ingenious way to separate out the notion that she doesn't want people to be paid for talent, but she does want them to be paid more if they take on more burdensome jobs. Now, let me just say one quick thing about that, burdens versus effort. So, Effort is really income over talent. It's how much effort you need to put into doing a job. Burdens are different. They're on how unpleasant is putting forth that effort. So that's why coal miner is worse than being a philosopher. And to Christie, we should pay a coal miner more because the burden is higher. Uh, because that effort is more costly in well-being terms as a coal miner than, say, as a philosophy professor. Now, economists tend to think that the market handles that. We tend to think that if uh, that if coal mining really is, in fact, much less pleasant than being a philosophy professor, you'll get paid more to be a coal miner if you have the same level of talent. And so I think the, the tension here that Christie wants us to really pay attention to is that we're sort of assuming this happens, maybe because talents move easily across occupations or because people get, it's malleable or because the labor market responds really well. There may be a variety of reasons why that's not actually a good assumption. So maybe talents are occupation specific. Maybe you're born into a coal mining family you're going to be a coal miner, and so coal miners, executives, can take essentially advantage of you and not pay you as much. So she, she criticizes Rawls as disregarding these. He may also just have a model that's more compensating differential focus that economists would have, that the, the job market will do that for you. But again, let's assume that Christie's right, and that's a big thing we need to worry about a lot. So then she has that thing. So the thought experiment. So the, here's just a couple of things that I think are worth um, thinking about going forward. So there's a little, it occurred to me there's a little bit of a catch-22, and I think this gets to Christie's efficiency thing she was talking about at the end. Um, you're going to pay based on these preferences for burdensomeness, not in talent, right? And so if you succeed in actually destroying talent rents, there's a bit of an invitation to really large efficiency costs. So suppose behind the veil or in this thought experiment, preferences for coal mining just happen to be really high among talented engineers, right? And then you're going to, once they step out from behind the thought experiment, they wouldn't get paid any more to be engineers. Well, then they're going to take the job as coal miners, because right? that's what they like doing. Uh, but the market wanted to pay them more because they were really talented engineers. And so now we've got this misallocation of talent, which is a pretty severe efficiency problem for an economy, even more than maybe, say, labor supply distortions. So you might be tempted not to quite fully offset talent rents. But of course, then you get into a different problem, which is that, again, suppose the same setting, so engineers want to be coal miners, but then after the thought experiment, you realize you've got to pay them a little more as engineers to get the allocative efficiency. So then, despite their preferences, these people prefer to be engineers. Well, they loved being a coal miner, so back in the thought experiment, you decided not to pay coal miners anything. So now the people who end up being coal miners are stuck with this super low income if their preferences are more sort of average. And so you actually ended up making it worse for the coal miners than if you hadn't had the minimum acceptability uh, thought experiment. So look, this might be sort of a pathological um, uh, example, but it's worth, I think, thinking through how it goes. Through the, the occupations, uh, again, I think Christie's pushing the economists to think more carefully about kind of how occupations work in the real world, as opposed to our idealized models. Of course, I'm a little skeptical that we can have policy so tailored to occupations without inviting a lot of distortions. Um, but uh, again, that may just be a bias from where I come from. So then for this room, this might be a, a more relevant or at least more controversial statement. 
Uh, and that is about this fairness notion. So the cake example, I think, is a great example, right? So of course, when the baker gives um, Betty one third and Andrew two thirds, that's unfair to us. But what if it was a, flip, a coin flip, right? So the baker bakes the cake, flips a coin, and then the cake is allocated based on the coin flip. Is that unfair? It doesn't seem unfair to me somehow. And then the real question for us, I think, is, is the allocation of talent more like the first cake or the second cake cutting, right? So I don't know, actually, <laughs> uh, but I think that's really important. Now, uh, right, so the view that talents are undeserved is sort of treated as a given in the paper, and Christie asserts that the idea that no one has more income simply because her talents are scarce has wide appeal, and I agree, right? So especially in the optimal income tax literature, uh, like Stephanie was referring to earlier, the notion that you're born with endowments but you sort of aren't entitled to them is very common. This notion for economists, this paper by Florbe and Manike in 2006 was really influential in this compensation versus responsibility distinction. But then there's this also other very famous paper in economics, Alessina and Angelitos, who talk about this multiple equilibria that Stephanie told you about, that there's one society with low redistribution and high effort, and there's another with high redistribution and low effort. And one thing people don't really know about that paper is that when they actually talk about the model, they talk about, um, with these terms, with the, okay, so the key element in our analysis is the idea of social justice or fairness. With these terms, we capture a social preference for reducing the degree of inequality induced by luck and unworthy activities while rewarding individual talent and effort. That's really quite striking, right? So now, Alberto and um, Mario's may not be the people whose normative preferences you particularly care about, but on the other hand, this very influential thing lumps talent in with effort as something that people are in fact entitled to. And so I'm not sure the unanimity is quite there. Okay, thanks.